Big O is a way to very roughly define how something grows in relation to one or more controlling variables. In computer science, it's primarily used as a way to define time complexity. So Big O will be used to pretty much say how well an algorithm scales when you're dealing with some different parameters. For example, if you're sorting some data, you might want to know how much slower that algorithm is going to get the more data you add that you're trying to sort. It can be used to describe things like best and worst cases, but normally people will go for like the average case. And there are mathematical ways to determine all of those things with Big O. However, I won't be going into the mathematics too much in this video because it's not super important for the context that most people will see Big O in. As long as you have a general understanding of what Big O is and what it means in regards to some algorithm, you should be fine. Another use case for Big O is for things like spatial complexity, which is instead of measuring performance or like a number of operations or something, it's measuring how much memory you're taking. Although this video, I will be talking about it primarily in the context of time complexity because once you understand how one of them works, it's easy to understand how it would work with like spatial complexity. Anyway, so big O is normally shown in the format of O and then parentheses and then some parameters. So in this case, this is big O of n squared. Of course, you probably don't have any idea what that means at this point. So I'd like to go over some examples to demonstrate what that means. So if you take a look at this code, I've got 4i in range n, print abc. So if you're familiar with Python, this is just a for loop that executes the code inside of it n times. So if you remember, I said that big O is a way to define how something grows in relation to one or more controlling variables. So if we say our controlling variable here is n, we can say that the amount of times that abc is printed grows linearly with whatever value is in n. So if n is 5, you'll see abc printed 5 times. If it's 10, you'll see it printed 10 times. So we would say this algorithm is big O of n because it scales linearly. So you might be wondering, if I put a second print statement in there, would it be big O of 2n? Because if n is 5 and there's two print statements in the for loop, you would see it printed 10 times. But in big O, you actually drop all the coefficients. And if you think about it, this makes sense because if you try to analyze just exactly how many operations something's going to take, you're going to have a very hard time because a print statement is not a single operation. It's doing all sorts of stuff in the background. Even if you get down to the lower level with C, it's taking up tons of operations. And that's something important to remember about big O. It's a measurement of growth. So there's not really value in having that coefficient there to begin with because 2n and n are both linear growth. So let's look at some more code. So for i in range n, and then for j in range n, print abc. So this code would print abc n times n amount of times, because it's a for loop inside of another for loop. So if n is 5, you would see abc printed 25 times. So for this algorithm, we would say that it is big O of n squared. So let's take a look at another algorithm. We've got the same thing as last time, except inside the first for loop, there's an extra print statement. So if you were to write out how many times it would be printed in terms of n, you would say that it was printed n squared plus n times. But interestingly enough, this algorithm is not considered big O of n squared plus n. This algorithm is considered big O of n squared. And that's because in big O, you drop all of the lower terms. There is an exception to this though, which I'll go over now. So if you look at this code, it's the same as the code from the example for, before the last example, except I've added an extra loop in there for i in range k, print abc. So this time, there's a section that can be written in terms of k, and there's a section that can be written in terms of n. So this entire algorithm as a whole can have two controlling variables. So in this case, you could say that the algorithm is big O of n squared plus k. If you remember before, I did mention that big O can be used to describe the growth in relation to multiple controlling variables. And this is a case where you might not drop the lower term. So I've got one more example I'd like to go over with big O. 
So we have this one line of code, it's just print ABC. So if you notice, there is no controlling variable right here. There is no n. No matter what you change, well, you can't change anything, this code isn't going to take any longer or shorter to run, at least in theory. Of course, in practice, it can vary all sorts of ways. But because this is a constant runtime and there's no variable to change how it runs, you would say this is big O of 1. And of course, if you had two print statements, it would not be big O of 2 because you drop the coefficients. Anything with a constant runtime that does not change is considered big O of 1. So in this series, I will be going over a bunch of different algorithms and data structures, and each data structure has their own operations, which are essentially their own algorithms, but it has a bunch of different algorithms associated with it. And those algorithms, of course, have runtimes, and then they can also have spatial complexity to determine like how much memory it needs to do that operation. So in this series, I will be going over what the different runtimes are for the different algorithms I will be showing you. If you ever do coding interviews or try to compete in programming competitions, you might run into problems where you're asked to create an algorithm that runs in a certain runtime. And this is where you would most likely see big O used. So there are some circumstances where it's useful to know this stuff. However, in my eight and a half years of programming, I've never needed the knowledge of Big O. If I go in interviews for some bigger tech company, though, it is very likely I will end up needing to understand it as a concept. So there are a couple more things I'd like to go over here, though. First of all, you will most likely see Big O in terms of N, even if an algorithm presented has a different variable name, people would normally write big O in terms of n or some other single letter variable. If it's unclear, normally people will provide which variable is associated with the variables used in the big O notation. Moving on, here's a list of common runtimes you might see. So starting at the lowest, there's big O of 1, which is a constant runtime. Then there's big O of log of n. This is a runtime that scales slower, so you would say this normally runs faster when being scaled than a linear algorithm. A common example of an algorithm that would be big O of log of n would be a binary search, which I'll get into later in this series. Next up above O of log of n, we have O of n, which is the linear runtime. So for this, if you have n of, of some value and then you double that value, it's going to take twice as long. This is definitely one of the more common runtimes and probably the easiest to understand. Next up, we have O of n log n. This one's interesting. You actually only see this in a few different algorithms that I'll be showing you. It's essentially just between n and n squared. Uh, but you'll see it on a lot of sorting algorithms. Because in sorting algorithms, normally you have to go through all of the data, which would, if the data, amount of data is n, just because you have to go through all the data in the first place, uh, would make it an O of n operation. And then determining what you would need to do in order to sort that data ends up making it n times log n, because there's some extra operations that go in there. And it's only in those really good algorithms that have some good tricks that have a sorting mechanism that scales well, they can get it that low. I think some of the first algorithms I'm going to be showing you are not going to be n log n, but you will end up seeing this pop up. So O of n squared is up next. This is one of the more common things you'll see in the sorting algorithms that are the bad sorting algorithms. And you'll also see it as a worst case for some of the better sorting algorithms as well. It ends up being the worst case for a lot of different types of algorithms in general. But I went over an example of O of n squared earlier. There's of course also things like O of n cubed. Uh, you don't drop all constants, it's just coefficients and lower terms. So you can have O of n cubed, you can have n to the 4, n to the 5, n to the whatever, really. Although when you start getting up there, it's pretty bad at algorithm normally. You'll normally end up seeing O of n squared more often than the uh, higher powers. Uh, next up, we have O of 2 to the n, 
uh, O of n factorial, and O of n to the n. These would represent a bunch of higher growth algorithms, uh, normally things that are pretty slow. You might see some of these pop up in some brute force techniques. I'm not sure if I'm going to end up covering any algorithms that fall into these categories, but yeah, that's pretty much the list of the more common uh, runtimes or spatial complexities or whatever you might be using Big O for. All right, that's it for this video. As I go through this series, I'll give you the different runtimes for different algorithms, and I'll explain how those runtimes were determined, and then hopefully, as you get through the rest of the series, you'll have a better understanding of Big O without having to go into the math that underlies it. Next video, I'll be going over arrays, and then hopefully I can work my way up from there to get into the more complex topics. If you like this video, please subscribe. It helps me out a lot. And then also, if you notice any mistakes I made in this video, please leave a comment, because I know with tutorials now, you cannot see the dislikes on YouTube, which makes it really hard for people to, to tell if there's something wrong with a video. So it would be very helpful for me and everyone else if you can point out any mistakes I might have made in the comments and then I can probably make a pinned comment mentioning everything. Hopefully I'll see you guys in the next video.